Well, we've got a very special guest to the podcast today. This is Jonathan Van Maren. He's the communications director for the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform. His writings have been translated into more than six languages and published in a lot of places. You've been published in the National Post, National Review, First Things, the European Conservative, the Federalist, the American Conservative, the Stream, the Jewish Independent, the Hamilton Spectator, Reform Perspective Magazine, among others. Jonathan regularly speaks on a variety of social issues at universities, high schools, churches, and other functions in Canada, the United States, and Europe. Welcome to the show today, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks for having me, Josh. I'm going to set up the topic in a minute, but I just want to share something from my heart that might seem a little bit weird. I might cut this out, but I just want to say, I want to explain why I'm particularly happy that you are on this show today is there's a cool pro-life unity thing going on with both of us doing this show because like if someone had told me a year ago hey do you know who's going to be on your podcast in a year jonathan van maren i would have been like i don't really believe that because we have disagreed about different things when it comes to strategies and tactics in the mm-hmm. past and uh, and in the in recently i've just grown a lot of respect for you from reading some of your recent writings on on politics and as we've talked about aha which is our topic today mm-hmm. it's just become so obvious you are the expert on aha especially what is going on right now and your thoughts are nuanced and thoughtful you're 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 a deep thinker and even though we probably still disagree about some things which is fine you maybe you're right and we're wrong there's like we both have kind of a mutual respect for each other. And I just kind of wish this happened more often in the pro-life movement where you pro-life leaders who disagree about different things, about tactics or whatever, still like, I don't think you care about abortion less than I do. And you don't think that I care about abortion less than you do. Like we can just like still partner together on something and and talk and learn from each other. And I just wish this happened more often in the pro-life movement. So I am really happy that you are here uh, with us today to talk about this. Yeah, no, I'm pumped for the conversation. It's going to be a good time. This is going to be a very interesting time. And I know that there are a few people who know that we're doing this episode that are very, very excited to hear it. <laughs> so so let me kind of set up our topic. This will be like the most I talk because I just kind of want to let Jonathan loose because he has so many good things to say. But just to kind of explain why we're even doing this, like we try to limit how much we critique pro-life activities in public. It's not that we never do. There are some people that would say you should never, ever, ever publicly critique any kind of a pro-life thing. That's not a rule that I agree with. When we critique pro-life stuff, we we try to, we're doing it out of love. We want to help the pro-life movement get more effective because effectiveness really matters. Abolish human abortion, uh, the group that we're talking about today, it's a little bit different. Uh, you know, as, as Jonathan pointed out, as we were going back and forth about whether or not we should do these episodes, I think Jonathan rightly pointed out, well, they don't call themselves pro-life. They very, very mm-hmm. specifically attack the pro-life movement. They are this kind of different thing. Um, but I just want to make sure just kind of in full disclosure, I have a little bit of history with AJ that's going to put on the table and people can, can you know, judge what, we, what I say, at least based on that, if they want. I wrote one article about AHA in 2014. They had critiqued one of my very good friends, Justice for All, um, Mm -hmm. and they critiqued them publicly. They were basically saying that Justice for All doesn't care enough about abortion. Um, Mm -hmm. And there was this video that they had posted, and it had a lot of logical fallacies in it. And I just felt like I should go and defend my friends. And so I wrote an article kind of doing commentary about that, that video. They, in turn, one of their people made a video about me calling me demonic. So just fair warning, you might be watching a demonic person on this podcast. Um, they later posted a, a, my headshot on a meme that was critiquing, I think or something like Josh Brown doesn't want to end abortion fast mm-hmm. enough or something like that. Yeah. Um, one of their members has since apologized for his role in that, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the only other thing I'll say is that Jacob on our team, he's the one who, who kind of helped create the content for our Sidewalk Counseling Masterclass. He has had a lot of very, very frustrating experiences of trying to Sidewalk Counsel next to someone who's affiliated with with abolish human abortion who is usually something like on a bullhorn yelling bible verses at abortion minded people who then basically run faster into the abortion clinic as a result and it's been so obvious to jacob who's really good at at, at, you know empowering women to, to save babies that he saves fewer lives if an aha person is there on the sidewalk with them and so that has been very very frustrating for him I felt like I was done talking about AHA, though, 
Except it seems like they're showing up on the radar more than they did before. And it seems like they're becoming even more militant than before. And I'll just give the example that kind of led to Jonathan and I connecting about this topic. I have been in touch a lot with Oregon Right to Life. Oregon Right to Life and SF is a really kind of cool relationship. I feel like they've probably hired me to speak at something more often than any group. So I'm in Oregon, you know, a lot. I was just over there a week ago and just love their team. Really, really cool group. And some of their chapters have just been having really awful encounters with AHA in the last year. And they've been kind of wondering, like, what do we do about this? So for example, they did like a life chain event, just kind of your standard life chain, you know, people holding signs on a certain day at like an intersection. Mm -hmm. And AHA people came out and were like basically stepping right in front of them to block people being able to see them and like holding up their own, you know, very, very different signs. And which is really obnoxious on its own. But then something that was worrying to me, though, was also they got someone from H. They got really, really mad at one of the Oregon Right to Life, you know, volunteers who was like an older gentleman who was out there and he was seating. He brought like, you know, a, a lawn chair or whatever, a, a beach chair, because he just couldn't stand for a whole hour outside. And they got so mad at him, I guess, about the fact that he was daring to sit down during an, uh, an anti-abortion protest that they were like in his face yelling at him. They were not wearing masks. So it's like peak COVID time. And this is an elderly guy. It was just like, it was very, very intimidating and kind of scary and, mm-hmm. and aggressive to them. And so I know they're all wondering, what do we do about AHA? Because a lot of their volunteers don't even want to come out and do stuff anymore because they don't want to be having these kind of awful interactions. So on their behalf, I reached out to a few of my friends who I know have at least thought about AHA a little bit. And Jonathan Van Maren was the most responsive and helpful. And it just, again, became really clear to me, you are the current expert on this group. It was a very dubious distinction. <laughs> I know. This might not go on your bio. I'm just saying, and maybe you've always been the expert, but at least right now, you're, you're clearly, because you have kept tabs on them in a way that they fell off my radar, mm-hmm. you know, six years ago. And given that AHA constantly and publicly attacks pro-life groups and people like us who are trying to end abortion as strategically and quickly as possible... And because their rhetoric sounds compelling to an untrained ear, I think if nothing else that people can hear both sides of the argument or be good for us to to discuss kind of thoughtful responses to some of the things that they say. So if you want a better idea of what AHA believes about ending abortion, if you're worried that maybe we will straw man them, I will Mm -hmm. post a link in the description to some page on their website that sort of explains where they're coming from. You can read it for yourself. Yeah, the best link to post would be their five tenets of abolitionism because that sort of summarizes their ideology. I I will post that. Okay, that was a very long-winded intro, but now that I've sort of set the table, Jonathan... Talk to us about AHA's origin, because that was mysterious to me. Like, uh, Mm -hmm. all I thought about them was like, oh, cool. There's a group that actually makes good looking memes. And like, I liked their page. I felt like, oh, it's like probably the only uh, graphic designer in the pro-life movement for a while. Mm -hmm. And they had really good looking memes. It was like, oh, cool. And then everything seemed to really change a year or two later. Explain, Explain their origin. So I, I don't know exactly what facilitated the change because to be completely honest, like they kind of flew by the seat of their pants for a while. Like mm. things sort of changed on the fly, but you're exactly right. Like they crossed my radar and the radar of most of the pro-life leaders that you and I both know because they, they put up, but they put together great memes with great quotes. Um, and like not a lot of original quotes, but even quotes from Francis Schaefer, like a lot mm-hmm. of, they resurrected a lot of really great pro-life yes. quotes. And then they had that AHA symbol, which they don't really use as much anymore, which was basically based on the idea that the British abolitionists had had, you know, the am I not a man and a brother slogan. Mm-hmm. And so there was this idea that symbolism was very important for a movement. And initially, I, I thought they were just a, a, an anti-abortion or pro-life group that, that saw the power of symbolism, of imagery. Um, obviously, um, I'm a big fan of that sort of thing as well. Yes. And, and then, you know, uh, it was, I think, probably about two years later when uh, T. Russell Hunter, whose name is going to come up a lot because he sort of made up most of this mess, um, <laughs> he, uh, he, he basically sort of like defining what an abolitionist was, right? An abolitionist, I think it's important for the listeners to recognize, is a very common term 
Yeah. That's been frequently used by anybody who wants to abolish anything. Yeah. Right. So it's, you know, it's it, historically speaking um, used by the, the three major wings of, of abolitionism. Um, there's the British abolitionists um, sort of started by the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade, uh, which was started by a bunch of Anglicans and Quakers. Then you've got the American abolitionists, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, Wendell Phillips, uh, and, 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 and they, they're a much different strain than the British strain, which we'll get into later. And then you've got the more revolutionary abolitionism, which is what created the country in Haiti, where you have a slave revolt that results in uh, massacres, and those ma- out of those massacres, they reestablish themselves as, as a, free, a free state. So there's those basic strains. But these days, like I have a T-shirt at my house with Abraham Lincoln on the front and abolitionists across the top that was created by a, an anti-sex trafficking organization, right? Huh. So it's a very it's a very common term used by a whole bunch of different people. Yeah. And what Hunter started to do was saying like the abolitionist is actually a combination of a spis- of his version of abolitionist historical strategy, as w- which is a fool's errand because there's so many different wings and the term encompasses so many different things. But it's also this like sort of theological term that means people who fight abortion in a very specific way and the first sort of boundary he, he laid down was and catholics can't be abolitionists oh I'm perfect not, so let's just know, take out all the catholics from the movement that'll be a yeah. great idea well yeah the movement wouldn't have started without the catholics yes. um like francis Schaeffer didn't show up till the 80s the religious right uh the fundamentalists didn't really show up till the 80s you know the catholics beat us on this i'm reformed myself so i don't really have a, a dog in that theological fight but yeah so he basically said oh catholics can't be abolitionists because abolitionists have a very specific religious perspective and then just to give you like a really sh- a short version of what happened until they dropped off most of our radar mm-hmm. um like it's interesting because they had a specific theological perspective, but they ended up getting kicked out of their. Most of the original abolitionists were kicked out of their churches. There was a lot of infighting. This is not a way, good sign. <laughs> this is not me dishing dirt. This was all very public because they would have fights amongst themselves and then like release or re- privately taped recordings of those conversations online. Mm-hmm. I saw some of them show up on Facebook. I listened to some of them. Some people that I know personally and quite well, you know, had their conversations recorded and those were leaked online. Like it was just really a, a really garbage, abusive, uh, like situation. I, I want to ask a clarification question about that. Okay. Am I understanding you right? Not only because I knew that they were secretly recording, mm-hmm. like sort of like these like arguments, like they, they, they would find someone from like national right to life at the conference yeah. and like badger them about incrementalism or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. someone is secretly recording on a camera on a phone yeah. and then they're wearing a little hidden mic mm-hmm. and then they release this sort of like Lila Rose covert, you know, mm-hmm. kind, kind of a, you know, yeah. look, we got the national right to life person admitting yeah. this. Live you know, action is sustained by the blood of the unborn. sort of thing. Right. Like that kind of thing. And, mm-hmm. But it sounds like what you're saying is then they start, did they start doing that with each other? They're secretly yes. recording their intern. That is yeah. hilarious. And again, this is, it's, it, it, this is, this was public. Um, like, so this is, I'm not airing sort of private dirt. Yeah. It's private to those who didn't see it, but this was like on Facebook. Um, this, like, that's how I know about it, right? I was never part of their group. Right. So, uh, but that, that, that's how I know what happened. Um, and then I like a lot of people who sort of like exfiltrated and, and detoxed from whatever they had going on in Norman, Oklahoma for a while, told a lot of stories about that. So it was, just, hmm. it was a really strange, a strange group. Um, um, T. Russell Hunter, like when he would get criticized would sort of lose his mind as most of us know, like I wrote a couple of articles critiquing the history and he did these long rambling YouTube videos while eating a sandwich, not hmm. responding to any of the individual points I made. Cause quite frankly, he couldn't because his knowledge of history is just very, very limited. Um, yeah. I, he doesn't understand the history of abolitionism. Um, like my dad always had a saying, you know, there's nothing more dangerous than somebody who's read a little bit. And it's he struck me as a guy quote. who who got engaged with 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 historical abolitionism, found it fascinating, as one should. It's it's an amazing story, yeah. uh, a very different story depending on which country you're in, but an amazing story. And that that sort of took off. And then he's like, hey, we should do the same thing. And like here I am reading the school from Wilberforce. We should do what he said here without the context to understand what uh, Wilberforce abolitionism versus Garrisonian abolitionism, for example, was, and then sort of turn his ideology, which was based on false historical premises, into also a theology. I haven't totally figured out the theology yet, hmm. because, like, yeah, I know it's Protestant, um, uh, because, you know, Catholics can't be abolitionists, but I, I haven't quite figured out, you know, how they've fused those two things together. And so, 
Anyways, uh, I remember talking with a lot of pro-life leaders, like, what do we do about this? Just because, you know, the, one of their hashtags was put an end to the pro-life movement. Um, right. they, they did a lot of slandering of, of pro-life leaders. And, and Hunter now has a podcast called The Liberator, which is named after the newspaper that William Lloyd Garrison ran, which he does with a few people who used to work with, with Created Equal and are now um, abolitionists. Um, oh. for, the, for those of you who are listening to this, I'm, I'm using air quotes because yeah. I, don't, I, I don't see the ownership of the term to them. And, 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 and he's sort of, he's got this narrative, like, you know, people like thought it was really terrible, but like now they realize I'm a really nice guy. And I'm like, no, I was like, I remember the stuff that he said, right? Like he did like long live stream videos, like ranting and precatory prayers that pro-lifers he disagreed with. Yeah. Um, he said those who disagreed with him and in some instances specifically, I got, like, I got screenshots what were not saved because they disagreed with him on, on strategy. Like, so he's now, he's now trying to pretend like, Oh, like just because I harshly critique people's sinful way of responding to abortion, they now think I was a bad guy. Like, no, I thought you were a bad guy because you said untrue, cruel and false things about people that I know. So right. yeah, he's, he's not, he's trying to worm his way out of that, but he can't get away with that. Um, like the imprecatory prayer video was like 45 minutes long. It was like him pacing his garage, ranting and stuff like that. He was, he, was, he, was, he was a very stable genius. Yeah. So as a clarification, I, I think I know what you mean by I want to make sure it's explicitly clear. Mm -hmm. When you say he kind of can't worm his way out of that, I think what you, what, what you mean is like he hasn't like apologized, repented, like been like, I've changed my ways now. I disagree with those things that I said before. No, what he's trying to do is he's trying to recast what happened as yeah. people got offended because he was too blunt and too truthful. He's like rewriting that's, history. That's what he's backfilling. And like T. Russell Hunter's been backfilling for a decade, right? Like he creates abolitionism. People point out he doesn't understand abolitionism very well. And so he, he, they, they switch back and forth, right? If I point out like that's not what abolitionism actually was and history is important for understanding context and strategy. I'm like, okay, but even if that incremental bill was like, like what we force did, it's also unbiblical. So they switch back and forth. Right. And if you say like, okay, but that's not actually true as it was, it's, it's evil anyways. So like, you can't have it both ways. Like if an incremental bill, um, it like, you know, is reminiscent of the way Wilberforce did things and it's incredibly effective. If it's evil, that doesn't, it doesn't matter. We can't do it anyways, right? We would right. agree that if it is evil, we cannot do it because you cannot do evil that good may come of it. But the, he switches back and forth between, yeah. you know, um, well, like the, the abolitionists never did that. I'm like, well, what about this one over here who did the thing you said they didn't do? Okay, I know, but like, it's evil. I'm like, well, like pick a lane, bro. So like when someone's doing that, it just seems like you're clearly, they're clearly being so ad hoc in their yeah. reasoning. They're oh, yeah. reasoning backwards. It's like, I know what mm -hmm. I want to say and I'm never going to admit defeat. I'm kind of constantly in debate mode where I, I, I'm not going to concede a point. And so I will just kind of like, tweak things as necessary to try to still make my point work. And it's like, and anytime someone's doing that, it's like, this is not someone doing honest reasoning. Oh, that's right. Um, I, I'm not even sure that it was intentional because like, to be completely honest, like T. Russell Hunter, very good graphic designer um, as an yes. artist phenomenally talented he's done some of the best like sketchings of, of, of the abortion procedure etc that i've ever seen in yeah. our movement. like there's a lot of crappy art uh yes. and poetry yes. and things like that in our movement t russell Most Hunter, of our movies yeah yeah genuinely talented um but he's just not a very he's just not a very good thinker like his right. worldview isn't cohesive and comprehensive when you actually look at history as it unfolded, um, like history is it, it's, history is very messy and very complex, and it doesn't lend itself well to a cut and dry ideology that is, again, we, he plays both sides, right? Like I derived this from my study of abolitionism. Okay, but like you're wrong for these reasons. Okay, but like well, the way you do things is wicked. Okay, well which which is it then? Right. Um, because your your definition of abolitionism doesn't reflect historical abolitionism, unless we're going to look explicitly at William Lloyd Garrison, which we'll get to later, because right. I do think that's important. Um, and if it's wicked, you need to explain why our differing strategies makes one of us evil. Like you and I have differing strategies on several things. I wouldn't sure. call your approach evil. And I hope no. you wouldn't call mine evil. Nor right? yours. Like, yeah. we, we have a difference of opinion. And so right. I actually was fine with, with the abolitionists when it was a difference of opinion as well. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's fine. Right? I disagree with lots of people. Sure. And, you know, as somebody who uses abortion victim photography, I know it's not fun to get critiqued by your own side in, in, in really heated terms. So I'm like, I'll leave it. There is a difference between criticisms from good faith people operating in good faith, but there comes a time when you're arguing with somebody and they say something and you realize, oh, you're a bad faith actor acting right. in bad faith. 
And this totally might, changes everything. Yeah. yeah and this might be ego. This might be, you got caught out on not having thought this through really well. And now you've got a huge like following that you've got to somehow placate. Like there's many different reasons for that happening, but that's when I realized that Hunter, regardless of what he says now was, was fundamentally a bad faith actor. Uh, and, and he'd like to say now, oh, I was just calling them out for their sinful approach to abortion. Sorry, I've watched the videos. I've read the comments. I've seen the messages. Um, th- it, this was so much more than that. Yeah. And so where the pro-life movement kind of put this to bed, and you and I were both part of these conversations, is yep. um, Greg Cunningham of CBR, who is, uh, uh, if I was to describe him in biblical terms, I would say as terrible as an army with banners, um, decided to accept T. Russell Hunter's constant offers to debate publicly. Yeah. Greg Cunningham, for those of you who aren't familiar with him, uh, is the founder of the Center for Bioethical Reform in California. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a former Air Force colonel um, and, and, and speaks like one. Uh, and and, and he's, he's, he's very intelligent and very yes. bored and very, like he, he, doesn't, yes. he, doesn't, he doesn't suffer fools. Yes. And, and so he didn't suffer Russell. Um, and he went to this debate and basically just wrecked him. Like I was watching yeah. it. I believe you were watching it as well. Yeah, I did too. I don't think I saw it live. I think I saw it like the next day, but it was not a fair debate. Yeah, I was on the road speaking. Um, and so I think I watched this in the Maritimes uh, and I, I watched it live. This was in 2015, so this would be six years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and it just, Hunter was exposed as somebody who had read a little bit of history, had mm-hmm. done some great drawings and clearly just didn't have basic responses yeah. to uh, to the challenges that Greg brought up, which honestly like makes a lot of sense like you know like pro-life strategy is, is not simple history is yes. very complex yes. it, you know and, and 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 hunter's group had grown sort of based on a lot of people who were really frustrated that abortion was still legal like yes. there's a lot of this where people were impatient they were frustrated mm-hmm. and a lot of people were like okay so can somebody please give me the magic bullet here what's yes. the Hiroshima or the Nagasaki of the abortion war so we can get on with our lives right. when in reality finding abortion is going to be a lifelong thing where you have to be faithful. You have to do it day in and day out. We have to persuade women individually. That's time consuming. Um, it's often painful. It's, mm-hmm. it's almost never fun. You um, sometimes got to change strategies and that's yeah. hard for people. Yeah. You got you to change strategies. Sometimes when you're talking to the next person you were talking to, that day, <laughs> right. And, and so there's a huge audience out there for people who want to be told this can be over quickly. If we can just, you know, do this thing now. Yeah. Um, and it's based on on a dual ignorance, ignorance of the history of the pro-life movement and ignorance of the history of, of abolitionism, which which he claimed to have a handle on. And so the thing that's really interesting, and I, I still have these screen, uh, I, I believe I have these screenshots on an old laptop, is that Hunter realized after the debate that he'd gotten completely wrecked. And, and, he, started, and he was saying this publicly, right? Like, I realize now I'm, I'm a better artist than a debater. No way. He said, I'm, I'm a better artist than a debater was one of his exact quotes. Um, and then sort of like his, his fans came sort of rushing out of the wings to like, like encourage him and basically said like, well, of course, you know, you, you, you couldn't debate properly because Greg was calling you wicked, which Greg didn't do. And I'm like, no, that's Hunter's shit. Right. He's, the one, he's the one who calls <laughs> people wicked and frequently says, well, with you. And, and, and he likes to use um, Old Testament prophet language because it, it has some real gravitas to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then the pro-life movement watched this debate. And I remember talking to a few of them. I'm like, you know, what? we have a debate. It's obvious to any good faith. Um, here who's not uh, who's like operating in good faith and examining the the arguments on their face this yes. is done now we've had the discussion yeah. um, Hunter's exposed as an intellectual lightweight if not a fraud I don't think that he's ever intentionally been a fraud hmm. I think that he went really big on a bunch of simple ideas mm-hmm. uh, and then he had to backfill um, when yeah. somebody was like hey this like perfect idea you have isn't true for this white red and he had to be like oh well, here's why it is right. so um, I think he's become, um, he became fraudulent, but I think he thoroughly believes in himself. Yes. Um, but there are moments uh, that I saw in, like where he would say things online where he knew he was out of his depth um, and, that he, and that he had to backfill. And so that brings us to 2015, and that's where the whole pro-life movement's like, okay, we're, we're done engaging because, you know, we sent out our champion. Um, yeah. <laughs> And and, 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 and and he's basically thrashed theirs. And so the people who are sticking with Hunter are not the sort of people that, that we can actually have this discussion with. Right. It bears mentioning a lot of the original people who joined Hunter, um, who sort of like left the pro-life movement to become an abolitionist, no longer work with him. Hmm. Um, because just, yeah, again, I don't have know. Have they come into- back to like the rest of the pro-life movement or are they just like done with fighting abortion? A bunch of them have dropped off the map totally. Huh. Because I don't know, I would say knowing what I know about them, they're probably still fighting abortion in some sense because they deeply, deeply care about yeah. abortion. 
So I, I, would, I would be stunned if they weren't. And I would assume for all the disagreements I have with them and how mu- and despite how much I resent some of the things that were said, I would say that to be fair to them, it's, they're almost certainly still doing something because the one thing I never would have questioned was their actual passion uh, against abortion. Absolutely. They, they like, really do care. Confronting the reality of like abortion, which like tears the body of an innocent child apart, does mm-hmm. weird things to people because it is, it is, but it's brutality. It's, it's horrifying. There's very few things as horrifying as abortion, right? If abortion is wrong, nothing is wrong sort of thing. Right. Um, and so I understand that like when, when confronted by that, different people react differently. And there is a longing in our culture for simplistic explanations yeah. to complex problems yes. that allow us to like do these things and you're going to be done. Um, and that's more or less the void Hunter filled. I also think it's very significant um, that Hunter came sort of out of the woodwork at the exact time where the pro-life movement was almost certain that Obama's two terms would be followed by a Hillary Clinton term Mm -hmm. and had pretty much at that point given up on Roe v. Wade ever being torn down. Oh, that's interesting. There are people who joined Hunter early on who had spent, you know, 20 years fighting abortion. And there was a lot of, and you probably remember this, there was a lot of despair when Obama Mm -hmm. got reelected that it was over, right? That, you know, since, you know, just after Roe passed, our whole goal has been to topple Roe. And there were people who had spent two decades, uh, you know, fighting abortion who came to the realization that I might die before it gets overturned, if it ever gets overturned. And that is quite something to face. Like I'm, thir- I'm 32. Right. So, yep. you know, like I was two years old when some of these people, you know, started fighting abortion. Right. And, to, yeah. and when your life's work was toppling row and you're confronted with that might not happen. Um, I have a lot of sympathy um, um, for those who, who were sort of facing that prospect. And so there was, there was a lot of, uh, there was a, like a lot of a demand for a guy who could say, here's why it hasn't worked so far. Here's what we got to do to make it work. Um, and just get on board with this. And like, some people, uh, I can name a few, sort of grabbed onto that like a life preserver. Like, oh, okay, right? Like yeah. maybe maybe it's just because we've been doing this all wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's because this game of inches just needed a nuclear bomb kind of thing. Right. I want to like contrast that with, because there's something that like, or, or, or things that we have said that might sound kind of similar. So let me just kind of compare and contrast mm-hmm. just for a minute just to make it really clear. So certainly part of the reason we started ERI was because we felt like there were certain elements of the pro-life movement that could get more effective, especially in the areas of like our apologetics, the way that we dialogue with people, especially one-on-one, things like that. But I've also been, I try to be very careful to say like, there is no silver bullet. Like we are not the silver bullet. Like it's not like just fund us, stop funding everyone else. And then we're going to end abortions. Like, no, Mm -hmm. we are like really good at one very narrow part of the pie. And there's a lot Mm -hmm. of other important groups doing a lot of different things. And it's going to take all of this stuff. So it's like T. Russell Hunter could have been right that, uh, that the pro-life movement could be more effective, but uh, and in some certain way, I would have been like very open. I'm always looking for ways that we can be more effective. But as soon as he's saying like, here's the silver bullet, just focus on us and no one else is doing anything good. In fact, they're evil and not saved because they disagree with us. Yes. That's the big warning sign. Not just evil and not saved though. Uh, it, it, responsible for keeping abortion illegal. Yes, and, and he still says these things on on the Liberator podcast. Um, mm. Which, if, you, if if anybody would like a really painful uh, experience, <laughs> you can feel free to bash your head against your computer screen on that. Uh, and I have uh, in preparation too to make sure I was caught up before I. I appreciate that. <laughs> I watched a bunch of them, uh, and he still he refers to it as like the pro life industry. And so here's another thing where you're not taking. Um, you're not operating in good faith because people I disagree with, like the idea, there are people in the pro life movement that I don't like. Yeah. Um, there are people that I think charge too much for yes. speaking. And I think it's unseemly yes. that somebody's making that much money talking about an injustice they should have. So totally agree. I do not think the pro-life movement is about criticism. However, yes. to state that they, you know, need abortion to be legal to get a paycheck is gross. Yes. Um, like I would never accuse them of that ever. Um, and, and he actually said at one point in, in the Liberator podcast, he said, I don't know their motives, but you know, when they're fighting on my abolition bill, like it expands their influence. Uh, and they actually say, he said about Ireland, right? Like that, you know, the American pro-lifers who, 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 who went over there and helped out, um, they probably wanted the referendum to fail and abortion to get legalized so the pro-life movement could expand their influence. Goodness. And then he said, I don't know their motives. That was his caveat, right? But like, it's kind of like, I don't know if this is true. But let me just well, toss this thought nobody's ever thought of. Okay. I don't know if they beat their wives, but like, let's talk about this 
theory for a while. But, yeah. but like there is motive there, right? right. We, could see, we could see why they might, right? Like this is just, it's just really, really gross stuff. Yeah. Um, and again, like there's different pro-life groups that I have different feelings about. Um, you would yep. feel the same way as oh, you mentioned absolutely. early on. There's plenty of stuff we disagree on. Yep. But like the idea that like the pro-life movement, because they disagree with this very brand new, ideology that right. he's called together um is in sin woe to them is a thing that he says very frequently still on his podcast i think he likes the sound of it um it's just it's just like for me that writes him off as somebody that should be engaged with like they're hmm. like like after this podcast i will 100 percent be contacted by several abolitionists like why don't you engage me on your podcast it's because they're not good faith actors right um like i, I won't bother i'm not going to bother to i'm the same way somebody yeah. Who mm-hmm. thinks that you know I am partially responsible for keeping abortion legal because I work full time for a pro life organization that pays me a salary? Right, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, interesting, Hunter, Hunter has switched on that because he used to really, and you remember this, right? Campaign on anybody who has a five hundred one c three in fundraisers. Yep. It's fundraising off the corpses of dead babies. Yes. He now has a five hundred one c three in fundraisers for his his new group, Free the States. How um, does he justify that? He said he said interestingly, and I, I, I think this is true. He said, oh, well, I realized you really can't fight abortion without funds. I'm like, uh-huh. That's what yeah. we've been saying. Like, you might have thought of that before you did the thing that you did, right? I'm... Like, like, and it's just like, oh, 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 no. So I realized that, like, a whole bunch of the, bl- like, blood libel that I was I was firing at people wasn't the case. But just some people had been here longer than 15 minutes like me. And so um, it turns out they were right. Just moving on, though, right? So he's doing a lot of backfilling. He's doing a lot of, uh, of recasting. And so none of us really talked about abolitionism for years. And I didn't really right. keep track of them either. Cause yeah, like, you know, Greg, Greg had, uh, had, had, had thrashed Hunter so thoroughly. It was a mauling, like it was a mauling that debate. Anybody wants to see it. Yeah, I'll, I'll link to that one for sure in the description. Yeah. It's, it was like, it was satisfying in an unsanctifying way. Sure. Um, <laughs> That's like, a very good way of putting it. Like wow. it's, you, we got to check our souls here a little bit while we're watching this thing. But yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the only reason I started to re-engage with the material they were putting out there is because they've got these um, what they call abolition bills that basically make abortion a, a crime across the books. And now there's pro-life politicians, governors, et cetera, who have different strategies. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to like sort of lay this out for people because I think this is really important. And it also, once again, shows that they're not a good faith actor and that they won't steel man their opponent's arguments. Mm-hmm. So there's, uh, I'm sure you've heard the term, right? Yes. Straw down and steel man. Um, yep. So anyways, these bills basically to say abortions, murder, um, most of them say, you know, women should be punished for having abortions, blah, 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 the whole long list. Well, wow. here is why um, pro-lifers oppose some of these bills is because if these bills pass in certain in, in certain cases, and these bills will vary a little bit from state to state. So I'm, I'm, I, the listener, be aware, go look them up for yourselves. I'm using yep. generalities here to make my point. Yeah. Um, and they would wipe all of the other pro-life laws off the books. So, you know, two decades of careful legislating and strangling the abortion industry with red tape yep. will be eliminated. Now, right. Hunter consistently claims, you know, the pro-life movement has failed for, for 48 years or whatever. Um, and it is obvious that the pro-life movement, of course, has failures. I would point out that the, the pro-life movement was, a, was an instinctive response to an event that nobody thought would happen. It is straight up true that a lot of stuff got made up as we went along. Yes. It's very true that we've been, we're still to some degree trying to respond to new situations. Like yes. this job shouldn't exist. Um, you know, there isn't a, there, there isn't like a, a, you know, a school fair where it's like be a pro-life activist and fight the fact that babies are getting killed down the street, right? Like it's, that's not a thing. So yes. And, and, and we're dealing with people, persuading people. And so, yes, it's very complicated. But yep. to agree with the idea that, you know, the pro-life movement has totally failed is ignoring the fact that while while we've lost on almost every major social issue, um, we've lost on, and, and we're pro-life specific, but let's just, to the Christians who are listening, which I suspect is the majority, yep. if you look at the LGBT issue, if you look at all these other issues, Christians have massively lost the culture war on those issues. Yes. Abortion has remained a 51, 49, 52, 48, back and forth right. issue since the early 90s when Gallup started polling. Yes. Just holding the line on that issue is an incredible achievement, yep. an incredible achievement. Well um, like if you look at all the different Christian social issues, uh, or I should say issues that Christians care about, there's one that we haven't lost on. Right. Uh, and in fact, there's only one issue where young people have increasingly moved towards the pro-life position. Right. I don't buy all the data on that. Like I don't buy that they're moving as significantly as some groups say they are, but even if they just weren't budging, it would be incredible. Right. So, so like, I'll just take the, the lowest common denominator. 
the pro-life uh, uh, movement also has accomplished the lowest abortion rate um, since since Roe v. Wade. Um, yes. You know, people forget that, you know, we were pushing up to a million and a half abortions, you know, a decade after row. Mm-hmm. That's down to 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 under a million. Now, yeah. like and, and and I don't want to be cavalier like, well, well what they would say to this, oh, well, you don't think that like you think that's a success. I'm like, I think that 500,000 less dead babies is a success. Yes. Yeah. So don't, year, don't, try yeah. To, don't try to accuse me of saying, oh, you know, like it's just, you know, it's just 850,000 abortions or whatever. What I'm saying is that. When Oscar Schindler saved, you know, thirteen hundred right. Jews, right. Um, I'm, I'm by by saying that's amazing. I'm not saying, oh, so who cares about the six million? At least we got right. these ones. That's not right. what I'm saying. Yes. But I, I know how these people work, so I'm just going to clarify that. Yeah. <laughs> then, if we look at the network of crisis pregnancy centers, which the Witherspoon Institute has, has very compellingly pointed out, there is no such thing as an unwanted baby mm-hmm. in in 2021. There's only such thing as babies not wanted by their biological parents. There is an adoption uh, adoptive home waiting for, for every child that would come up for adoption. There is actually the support that exists. We sometimes have a distribution issue. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like the infrastructure that's been set up pastorally, unbelievable, uh, like incredible. 70% of the abortion clinics have shut down since 1991. Mm-hmm. Um, and the abolitionists will respond by saying some of these have just been subsumed into you know, Planned Parenthood super centers. Yes, that's true. However, the fact that we've got half a dozen states that are almost entirely free of abortion clinics proves that that is not always the case. Right. And so some of these clinics have been shut down by the very good work of people who've been working to shut them down. Um, in some cases, Planned Parenthood has basically stated a monopoly on abortion. In other places, just the tireless decades-long work of pro-lifers exposing the abortion industry for what it is has resulted in states with almost no abortion clinics or, in one instance, no abortion clinics. So. Right. I'm just responding to their critiques as yeah. they come up. Um, and so to, to say that the abortion movement is a failure on its face um, is ridiculous, self-serving, and slanderous. Uh, to say the abortion of uh, the pro-life movement has made many mistakes and can improve in almost all areas is always going to be true. Yeah. Um, like, unless anybody's going to say, I've got the perfect strategy. I've come up with the perfect way to talk to people. I've come up with the perfect outreach strategy. Um, and, until that's true, which is never, uh, you know, we've always got things we can improve on, uh, you know, and, and criticism made in good faith by people operating in good faith is something I will always be willing to listen to um, because we've got the same goals in mind. And so, yeah, this whole, whole pro-life industry thing, which is, is, still their, is still their line, basically what they're doing now is, 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 is the pro-life movement has created all these regulations and these laws. And this is interesting, as another side note, Hunter calls it regulationism, which is a word he made up uh, in order to describe a thing that he thought up. Um, these abolition bills will wipe away two decades worth of careful legislating that has brought the abortion rate to the lowest that it's been. If the abolitionists dispute that, go look at Dr. Michael New's uh, work. Um, he went to some of America's finest universities. If you disagree with him, like, again, we're not operating the same set of facts, and so we can't have a debate, um, which I suspect is true. Let me ask you a quick question about the, about the Michael New thing, because I agree. Like, if people want to understand how effective some of the pro-life incrementalist bills have been, like, in certain states— Dr. Michael News research has like is clearly like the top of that, and we'll link to that. I just want to ask a clarification question about like, would you agree with like my view on the abortion rate declining is that it's partially incrementalist bills, but then there's also mm-hmm. other things mixed into like birth control being used more often, like there are like young people are actually having premarital sex less than they used to. Like mm-hmm. there's like a bunch of different factors that kind of coalesce into this. Would you agree with that or, or would you say it's just the incrementalist bills? So I would agree that um, the abortion rate's been driven down for a whole bunch of different reasons. I interviewed Dr. Michael New on this and he would agree with that as well. Um, I would I would 100% agree with you that like the reduction in premarital sex is hugely contributing to this. Yep. The research is still out on, on, on birth control because there are some studies that indicate that um, contraception gives the illusion of, of sort of being bulletproof in pregnancy. So it, it encourages more risky behavior, which results in more pregnancies, which results in more abortions. Uh, my honest answer to that is I don't know. There's sure. like intuitively it would make sense if more people are using contraception, less babies are happening. But then you've got this, you know, unintended effect here of people are having more sex because of that. And then why are you know, people having less sex? It's not because they're more moral. A lot of it's because they're watching a lot of porn, which is something I've researched a lot. And so, you know, they're sort of outsourcing, they're outsourcing their urges uh, to the internet. So, right. no, I would agree with you 100% on, on that. And so what Hunter and a couple of people on his team are saying 
is that pro-lifers are actively attempting to stop abortion from being made illegal in the states where these abolition bills are spring up because they oppose us. Again, this is a, it has to be, okay, there's two options here. Either he is, he is knowingly strawmanning our position or he's just too stupid to understand our position. And I'd like to do him the service of assuming he's strawmanning us rather than that he's too unintelligent to get this. But yeah, I don't really, even know. I don't even know which one is better. <laughs> I, I don't know which one is better. He's a worse person if he's intentionally strawmanning us. True. But when he says pro-lifers could make abortion illegal overnight, they're just not doing it. That's a lie. Yeah. Right? That's a lie. Right? If we can make abortion, like we have, we, we don't believe that their strategy would work. Right. Because what would happen is you pass an abolition bill, it would wipe all other abortion regulations and abortion laws and abortion restrictions off the books. It would go, it, it wouldn't even make it to the Supreme Court. Right. Like right. the Supreme Court wouldn't take up a bill like that right now. Right. And so the reason they've got their free the states ideology is they're saying like states should not listen to this unjust decree is what he frequently calls it. And it's like, OK. Um, and then what? And so it's so much of abolitionism fails when you ask. And then what? Um, mm. Because the way the, the American system is set up and you can hate it, um, as right. Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst system except all of us that have been tried. Right. Um, <laughs> you're not going to actually get an abolition bill that stands. And so there's a number of presupp uh, presuppositions that they make. So in order for it to be true that an abolition bill passing would make abortion, say, illegal in Arizona or illegal in Oklahoma, a number of things would have to happen. First, the state would have to ignore the courts and just say, yeah, this is an unjust decree and we're not going to listen to the courts. Right. Then the federal government would have to decide we're just going to let the states do whatever they want. Right. Um, because, you know, apparently Oklahoma's just not cool with the way things are done. I also am not cool with the way things are done. It would so be like a pro-anarchy move. It would have to be like a pro-anarchy move from the federal government, which would be just so really odd, right? Well, and so basically it would be like, okay, different states can make different decisions based on what they want to do, which just renders, it doesn't render Roe non-void, it renders the court non-void. Now, yeah. I agree with all of our critiques of the Supreme Court. Uh, I can articulate most of their critiques of Roe better than they could because they haven't read some of the best books on Rome. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't, I, I am unfortunately operating in a reality that I don't like, right. but that doesn't give me carte blanche to invent a new set of facts and say this, we just got to do this and it will work. Right. And so here's where we double back to history because this is very important hmm. is again. So they are not, Wilberforce abolitionist that they talk about him a lot, but Wilberforce was by definition an incrementalist. Yep. Like he, like, you know, the Dolben bill that restricted the size of slave ships is like, is like the brainchild for the, the laws regulating abortion clinics to yes. get them shut down, right? For, you know, stretchers and stuff like that. And, oh, this just irritates me. When they're like, oh, see, the pro lifers only care how wide the hallway is. I'm like, no, you idiot. The reason they created that law was so the clinic would get shut down. Right? They weren't like, ooh, like we care that you know the hallway is that big. No, they literally wrote the law to shut an abortion clinic down. That's the purpose of the law. Right. Right. So like either you're playing thick or you're being thick, and I'm not sure which is which, but either way, it amounts to slander of people who've been doing really hard work for a very long time to save more babies than you could ever hope to. Right. Um you got then you got like the flags bill that Wilberforce also engaged in. Mm -hmm. He was always conflicted about strategy. So they'll like they'll point out, like, oh, he said he wished he hadn't done this thing. I'd be like, see, he repented. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that easily. Um, because the pro-life movement, like the abolitionists, are absolutist in the way they speak mm -hmm. and they're incrementalist in the way they move because we live in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think abortion is the, like the brutal destruction of a pre-born human being in the womb. I will support whatever law saves more of those human beings. Right. That doesn't mean I'm incrementalist in the way I view abortion. It means I'm incrementalist and in that I'm going to take as many as possible. Right. Um, We're the firefighter saving as many as we can from the burning building as some other smart person used came up yes. with that analogy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think it was Scott Gusendorf. I, I think so exactly. too. But yeah. So th th that's exactly it. And then, and, and interestingly enough, like if you look at, if you look at William Wilberforce, um, in 18, so they, they started their campaign in 1787. That's when the uh, the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade was formed in a little bookshop on a rainy night in London on St. George Street. The bookshop is no longer there. Um, and they had a debate almost immediately about whether they were going to try to ban slavery itself in the empire or whether or not they were going to just go for the slave trade, which seemed more achievable. They decided on the slave trade, which is why it's the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade, not of right. slavery. Right. In 1807, two decades after the campaign began, they achieved the abolition of the slave trade. It wasn't until 1833 that slavery itself was banned. And like the government, 
issued the unjust decree where the slave owners got like got reparations. They got paid right, right. for for the freeing of, of the slaves. And he often he often talks about like sort of uh, like it's kind of funny. I was thinking like like Russell Hunter sort of like the pro like the alt right of the pro life movement. So what he would say about the, what he would say about the cuck abolitionists is that you know they they wanted emancipation but they wanted to ship them off back to Africa where they wanted to you know set up a colony that was exclusively segregated. Well, like. Sierra Leone was a colony for former slaves funded by Wilberforce and Granville Sharp and initially run by John Clarkson, the brother of Thomas Clarkson, who was the like the activist wing essentially of the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Again, this is complex stuff. And you take the different different biographies of different of different uh, abolitionists and you're gonna you're gonna find different things. They disagree yeah. on things. Yeah. Um, like the pro-life movement does. <laughs> But like it's interesting because I actually have um, a, a firsthand artifact that proves what a difference there was between the Wilberforce wing and the William Garrison wing, which I would describe if we're going to try to make an abolitionist pro, a pro-life comparison, however imperfectly as it works, I think it's fair to say that, that Hunter and his folks would be like William Lloyd Garrison, which is both a compliment and an insult at the same time. So talk a little bit about the history of that for those that don't know as much history as you do. I, I own a five-page letter written by Thomas Clarkson, actually handwritten to uh, an abolitionist in, in the United States, referring to a visit by American abolitionist in which he expressed his concerns about William Lloyd Garrison, abolitionist and editor-in-chief of the Liberator, because he felt like, well, Garrison's radicalism was actually hurting the movement and hurting the, hurting the anti-slavery cause, which I found super interesting. Yeah. Um, which is not to make the point that Clarkson was right. It's to make the point that you don't get to have both the Garrisonian abolitionist and the Wilberforce Clarkson abolitionist, right? You can say, I'm a Garrisonian, and, and you guys are Wilberforce Clarkson, there. I will happily take that, as will become clear later, because I'm going to explain why I think Garrisonian abolitionism isn't necessarily the you know the train ticket you know out of this hellhole that they think it is. Um, so just to kind of give you a very very rough overview, and there's a, there's a three part series on PBS called The Abolitionists. It's mm. phenomenal. So anybody who wants to get a, a more fulsome understanding of American abolitionism, do check that out. It is it, it's honestly like you'll go with it. Um, but you, so in American abolitionism, you also have a strain, right? You've got the John Brown abolitionist. You know, he's the one who stormed Harper's Ferry with some some ex slaves. You know, he chopped a slave owner in half. He was violent. I absolutely do not think that the the pro life abolitionist <laughs> that should make some heads explode. Um, I do not think that they advocate violence or are John Brown abolitionists. Uh, as uh, my understanding is that they like they have explicitly rejected any form of violence, and I take them at their word, which is a is a, a compliment I'd like them to pay us uh, one of these days. Yeah. Um, then there's a, a Frederick Douglass, who was probably the greatest orator of, of, of the abolitionist movement. He's buried in Rochester, New York. Interesting. I visited his grave last year. Um, and, and he kind of vacillated, like, how do we end slavery? And he was initially like sort of like this intellectual powerhouse. But towards the beginning of the Civil War, he did feel like, OK, maybe John Brown's right. Hmm. Um, then you have William Lloyd Garrison, um, who used really radical language. Um, I have a copy of the Liberator, one of the original newspapers from 1859, actually hanging in my library. Um, I find him to be a fascinating figure. Um, he's not the theologically pure figure uh, that, that, the, that these abolitionists might like to think. Like he, he did seances to try and contact his dead wife and things like oh, that. So, wow. so, so to call him orthodox would be quite the stretch. Um, and so interestingly, um, let's, let, let's look at one of the quotes that, 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 that Hunter, again, this is where you cherry pick quotes and it's dangerous to read just a little bit. One of the quotes he would frequently use to prove that American abolitionism is a result of the end of slavery was he would quote Lincoln as saying, you know, the abolitionists have done this sort of thing when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. I would like to point out that Abraham Lincoln was a brilliant incrementalist who could not, based on abolitionist ideology, earn the votes of any abolitionists. Just to show where their ideology is at, Lincoln wouldn't qualify. So, you know, here's, here's Hunter and the progressives holding hands. Like, it's not good enough. Um, and what Lincoln actually said was it was the abolitionists and the army. You know, the army seems like a significant part of that sentence. Right. Because essentially, yeah, the abolitionists um, turned slavery into an issue that was so monumental and so important that the union could not stay together right. with this issue weighing on them. Now, right. so when they say... We are free the state's ideology. Our abolitionist ideology is modeled after William Lloyd Garrison. How did Garrisonian abolitionism conclude? It didn't conclude in a slave trade act of 1807. It didn't include the abolition of slavery in, 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 in 1833, you know, passed through the British House 
um, in an orderly fashion. It resulted in a civil war that ended with the deaths of over 600,000 people. Uh, if you read Lincoln's inaugural address, second inaugural address, and any of you who haven't should, it's the greatest political sermon ever preached and the greatest speech in American history. He understood uh, that, sla- that the, he understood slavery as God's just punishment, or the Civil War as God's just punishment for slavery. And actually says explicitly, if God shall demand one drop of blood drawn by the sword for every drop of blood drawn by the lash, we must say the judgments of the Lord are good and just altogether. Wow. Um, like he understood that the reason this war was going on is, yeah. is, is that God was punishing them for slavery. But that's not a strategy. Um, if you say I'm a Garrisonian abolitionist, how did Garrison achieve, if you're going to attribute the achievement to him, and, and you absolutely have to uh, attribute to Garrison, um, radicalizing many Americans on this issue to the point where civil war became inevitable. You do have to credit him on that. But yeah. how in 2021 are you suggesting we – Take these historical events and transplant them. Now, the interesting thing is, it, it's not that Hunter and the abolitionists want civil war. It's that they simply refuse to play the history all the way out when they're discussing it. So huh. when they're saying, we need to free the states, right? Um, and, and, and we just need to pass these bills, and then states will ban abortion, and then we'll just ignore the court, and, and, and it'll be fine. And the pro-lifers are saying, no, what will happen is your bill is going to get overturned by the first court it goes to. The Supreme Court won't take it up and will be minus all the abortion regulations that have driven the abortion rate to the lowest it's been since Roe. Like, right. that will actually happen. They're like, no, it won't. Because, you know, we're Garrisonian abolitionists and Garris, uh, Gar- like William Garrison succeeded. Like, yeah, but that was actually, you know, the Army of the Potomac. Right. Um, <laughs> like, it, it's not like, a, 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 and the Emancipation Proclamation, by the way, which was an incrementalist piece of legislation. It wasn't even legislation. It wasn't even legislation. I, I forgot the right political term. Like, yeah. That was actually put forward by an increment, a profoundly incrementalist president. Hmm. Right? Wendell Phillips, another one of the abolitionists that they love, and again, Phillips is an incredible guy, called Lincoln a first-rate, second-rate second man. A first-rate, um, second-rate man? <laughs> yeah. Because, like, you know, he was really good, but, like, he was incrementalist, right? Yeah. Um, but the abolitionists would not have succeeded without like in the, the incrementalist yeah. and they wouldn't have got what they wanted without a uh, civil war. So like to uh, just to, you know, sort of point my finger in the other direction briefly, that there are like sort of the paleo Confederates or the neo Confederates who say, who, who point at, 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 at great Britain and say, why couldn't we have ended slavery that way? Why do we have to, why did we have to have a civil war? Well, the reason we had to have a civil war was because the Confederacy's constitution laid next to the American constitution was almost identical, except that it shrined slavery as a constitutional right. So mm. it was. It would literally be unconstitutional for the Confederacy to get rid of slavery naturally, so to speak, the way Great Britain did. That is why they like, both sides up the ante. I've the never court. thought about that before. That's fascinating. Well, but no, this, but that's the critique of, of the Paleo Confederates is literally that like we didn't need to have a civil war. We could have just uh, organically got rid of slavery the way the British Empire did. But no, because you wrote into your constitution. If you lay them next to each it's, fa- it's a fascinating exercise. And I'm, I, I'm sure there's someone on the internet that's done it. If you lay them next to each other, they're almost identical, except for the Confederate constitution sort of yeah. enshrines the right to slavery. So, <clears throat> again, I do not think that the abolitionists want civil war. I also think that they're either ignoring or refusing to grapple with the way American slavery actually ended. Yeah. So they're not Wilbur Force or Clarkson abolitionists by, by definition. They're not. Yeah. Um, they spent 20 years getting rid of the slave trade. 1833, they finally got rid of slavery itself. Um, very, and, and like Clarkson himself, they had concerns about Garrison's radicalism. Garrison being a Christian, but quite an unorthodox one who did things like seances that I suspect would, would earn the, the woe, is, woe is you condemnation from Hunter yeah. if he had the misfortune of living in the present. Um, then if you look at American abolitionism, uh, the, the, the Garrisonian abolitionism, um, the, the abolitionists themselves, besides their newspapers, besides their agitation, besides their lobbying, how, how was abolition accomplished? Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln the Incrementalist, and a, a civil war that ended the lives of 600,000 people. Yeah. Um, and basically the blood guilt of slavery um, was sort of purged from the republic by a blood offering of 600,000 people. At least that is the way Lincoln understood it. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a massive fan of Abraham Lincoln. I have a portrait of him hanging in my hallway and I named my son Lincoln. So that gives you an idea of where I'm at on, on, on picking a team there. Um, so again, I, I really do think that, that Hunter's, I won't call it a philosophy because that's too kind. Um, his ideology is just really simplistic, mm-hmm. um, badly researched, um, almost entirely cherry picked. 
and based on a false understanding of both history and, and theology. And uh, theologically, it's because he literally will say things like, if you ban abortion at heartbeat, if you ban abortion at pain capability, if you ban abortion at viability, you were legalizing abortion in those other circumstances. Right, I mean, right. If somebody put forward a law and said, we're banning abortion at the heartbeat be because prior to that, it is not a human. It is not creating God's image, and you can kill it. I would oppose that bill. That's immoral. That's wrong. Right, right. It doesn't say that, though. We're taking yeah. what we can get right. right now. And so, again, either he's lying and slandering pro-lifers by mischaracterizing our position in a way that makes us out to be justifying murder, or he just simply doesn't understand these things very well, which wouldn't surprise me. Um, yeah. And like, it's just it's like it's bad history. It's bad theology, and it's devoid of philosophy. So on that note, we're out of time, <laughs> but this is a really good start, but there's, we have, we've got more to say. And so uh, we'll be bringing you back for a part two on this. This has been really helpful so far. I hope people get a sense of like, basically my conversation with, with John originally on this was basically just had just happened for you in real time. And I'm just like, okay, I just need to bring him on to talk about this. So Jonathan Van Maren is the communications director for the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform. You can learn more about them at endthekilling.ca. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jonathan. Yeah, it was a good time. <laughs>